All right, so uh, welcome. My name is Xiao Kang Chiu from Purdue University, and uh, uh, the talk is about the natural synthesis of provably correct data structure manipulation. This is joint work with Amando Solar Lizama from MIT. So obviously, this is a synthesis session, so this is about synthesis. Uh, in the past few years, um, we have seen tremendous progress in program synthesis, and a very successful parad paradigm is syntax guided synthesis. So uh, basically, the user starts from the specification, both the syntactic template and semantic constraints. Um, then the synthesizer will generate a program uh, which satisfies both the syntactic template and the semantic constraints. So this is a very successful um, paradigm uh, which has su um, successfully synthesized programs in many application domains. But one caveat is that the uh, syntax guided synthesizer usually just inline the function for bounded number of times and unfold the loops for bounded number of times. So it's not necessarily correct for arbitrary size input. So the question is how to generate provably correct programs from the specification. So uh, we know how to do this. Uh, uh, and the natural way is to resort to the verifier because people have worked on program verification for more than 50 years. So if the, verification, the verifier can confirm that the program is correct, then uh, the synthesis is done. Otherwise, we can provide some feedback to a synthesizer, uh, typically a count example or some other feedback. So a synthesizer can come up with better solutions. Uh, but this only works when the, ver the specification is not very rich because of the, the inherent complexity of verification. If we want to synthesize from very rich specification, not just uh, memory error free, not just buffer overflow free, uh, just about the full like, functional correctness, right? So the verification cannot be automated because uh, it needs to synthesize some proof artifacts like the um, looping variants, ranking functions, etc. cetera. So um, this is, these are usually generated um, in a heuristic way. Um, so in that case, if the verification, verification fails, the programmer needs to determine who is to blame, right? Could be the case that the synthesized the program is not correct, or the synthesized the program is correct, but the verifier is not, uh, didn't, didn't get the uh, correct artifact to get the proof goes through. So, um, and more importantly, the whole workflow is no longer fully automatic. Um, that's why we uh, want to have a holistic approach that brings program synthesis, artifact synthesis, and the verification um, into one take. So a known approach is called proof theoretic synthesis, uh, proposed by uh, Srivastava et al. in their purple temp paper. So again, they start from very rich specification and uh, convert the specification to something called synthesis condition. So a synthesis condition does the three uh, tasks in one take. So it asks for a program and some invariants and ranking functions such that the verification condition uh, is correct. So if this logic, so logic formula can be solved by some powerful um, solvers, then we get a provably correct program. Uh, and uh, so as you can see, the system, the, the whole approach relies on a powerful logical reasoning. And this typically works for uh, decidable theories like ar arithmetic, arrays, uninterpreted un functions. Uh, but in our context, we want to uh, it, it does not work for data structure manipulation and other complex fields that we don't have uh, uh, decidable reasoning or powerful automatic reasoning. So that's uh, the that's motivation, that's the context. In this talk, we extend the proof theoretic synthesis to something we call natural synthesis. The idea is that the synthesis condition cannot be solved, so we reduce, re reduce it soundly to something called natural synthesis condition. So this is a, a different logical formula, um, but it can be solved using the known theories and the existing solvers. If there's a solution, then we know the solution is correct. It's nothing to worry about. Otherwise, there's no solution, so that means we have to give up. There's no simple program that can be verified uh, using the natural proof technique. So that's, uh, that's a basic setting. It's not a complete uh, approach, but it's sound. So uh, we uh, implemented the idea in a language called ImpSynced. So let's uh, start with a running example. Suppose that you want to uh, insert a key into a list. So the programmer can, can write an imp-synced template starting from a, uh, a specification in terms of precondition and postcondition. The 
post condition, pre condition just says uh, the input is not and the output says uh, the, in the output is still a list and uh, the length min max will be updated uh, appropriately. So this is not the full specification. This does not say, oh, the um, key is indeed inserted. But this is rich enough to uh, exclude a lot of um, non correct uh, uh, implementation. So, in addition to the rich specifications, the user also provides a template, a skeleton, which conveys the intuition of the, of the implementation. Basically, the template says there are two branches, two uh, cases. In the trivial case, the user, um, uh, and the node will be the head of the list, and uh, that's it. Otherwise, in the non-trivial case, you need to go through the list to find the location to do the insertion and then just do the insertion. Um, so this is just a template without uh, implementation details. Uh, the language allows the user to write an unknown condition. So the, the condition for the cases are unknown. And uh, some unknown variables to create a node to do the insertion. And uh, um, in the non-trivial case, the simple loop says there will be a loop. Okay, and with some estimation of the number of location variables and the uh, integer variables. These are just some reasonable numbers to estimate. And then after the loop, uh, a location has been found and we do the insertion using some unknown statement. And with this template, uh, here's the output from our system. Uh, this is a full implementation the, and uh, with the artifacts. The green part are all generated automatic, automatically. So, uh, Notice that uh, here's invariant with uh, some conjunctions. So this is a very sophisticated invariant, but this is they have been generated, and the ranking is generated. So everything is there. The proof is done. So the program is satisfy the specification as the uh, as the authentic implementation that people would expect. So that's what uh, natural things things can do for us. Uh, so. Um, the idea is, as I said, it's about proof things, uh, natural synthesis. And so what are natural proofs and natural synthesis? So uh, in the most general sense, natural proofs is a proof methodology. So a logic is a language in which you can talk about theorems. And to prove a theorem, it's a process of searching for a proof in the space. If a proof is found, then uh, the theorem is correct. For different theorems, you will find different proofs. And uh, if the logic is expressive enough, you can talk about the verification condition for like sorted list insertion and find a proof from the search space. So this is an approach taken by a lot of expressive logic, like separate logic, higher order logic, matching logic, et cetera. Um, but as you can imagine, the logic is expressive, so search space is also large. The proof search cannot be automated. It's uh, not even complete. So another op because we need to search for uh, every single corner of the search space. Another approach, another op option is to have decidable fragments. So uh, a lot of decidable logics are out there for data structure verification. Um, um, so the logic becomes decidable, but it's not, it does not necessarily mean the uh, proof will be easier because again, uh, we need to search for the whole uh, space uh, it, the decidable logic just says uh, uh, search will terminate. So our approach is to, uh, natural proofs insight is to restrict the search space, not the logic. So the lo if we can identify a class of proofs which uh, uh, reflects the human proofs, which is simple and, uh, and usually not too large, so that this is a small class of proofs that you can go through, you, you can search for it thoroughly in a decidable fashion then uh, in a lot of cases, you can still find uh, uh, proofs uh, for a lot of sophisticated uh, logical formulas. Because uh, if people write a program, uh, usually there's a very simple and natural proof. So if we can identify a class of proofs that could be potentially useful in practice. So we give up the completeness, but uh, that's, uh, that's a price to pay. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's, uh, that could be useful. And we have uh, worked on natural proofs. Uh, we developed a uh, logic called the Dryad uh, in the past few years. This is a logic for representing heaps. In this logic, the heap is represented to using graph plus data. Uh, if you have, uh, so every record is represented as a node, 
And if you have point of fields like left and right, they are represented as edges on the, on the graph. And data fields will be numbers associated to each node. So for example, the right hand side is just a binary search tree representation. So based on this heap representation, uh, dread logic in a nutshell, it's a quantify free first order logic extended with recursive definitions. So with the recursion, you can talk about, talk about a lot of very sophisticated properties. For example, you can define the height recursively. Uh, in the base case, if the tree x is nil, it's an empty tree, then the height is zero. Otherwise, you compute the height of the left and right subtrees recursively, takes larger one and plus one, that's how you compute the height. So you can define a lot of different uh, definitions to talk about the uh, sophisticated properties. So that's a basic setting, that's the logic, but what's the, uh, what are natural proofs? What kind of proofs we are looking for? So going back to the running example, suppose that we have done the synthesis. The program is there, the invariant is there. So how do we prove that the invariant is indeed an invariant? So this invariant says there's a sorted list starting from H, and there's a sorted list segment from H to V2, and among some other uh, constraints. So how do we prove it? Uh, if we pick a heap which satisfies the invariant, we can simulate the execution of the uh, loop body. Uh, V1 equals V2, so we update V1, and then we update V2 to the next uh, uh, node in the list. So we get uh, a new heap, which is still satisfies the invariant. So we can say, show that this is an uh, invariant, but this is a particular case. How do we argue that it's true for arbitrary heap that find the, the invariant. So what would you do if you prove it manually? You would do some abstraction. Right? You don't care about uh, how large the list is. You care about the uh, uh, nodes pointed by some key nodes pointed by the, the variables and uh, abstract the list. So uh, this is some representation we call symbolic heap. So red nodes represent a list segment from H to V1 and V2 uh, points to a green node. This is a symbolic node representing the rest of the list, right? So we don't care with a concrete heap, but we have some, a, a summary of the list. So with some numbers characterizing the length of the list and what's the minimum key and largest key in, the, in this segment. So with this uh, abstraction, we can uh, still simulate the execution, right? Update v1, and the next statement will dereference v2. So to do this, we need to concretize the symbolic node because we want to do the reference. And after the concretization, uh, we can go ahead and uh, simulate the second uh, uh, statement. So that's, uh, that's the idea of natural proofs. We, because we have only a finite number of nodes representing all possible heap, uh, this is a simple proof that uh, people will uh, write manually. And this is what we want to capture. And uh, obviously, natural proofs are sound. If you can prove a verification condition with the symbolic heap uh, semantics, it's true for arbitrary concrete heap, but not necessarily the other way around, because the uh, symbolic heap may represent some not feasible concrete heaps. Uh, and uh, we can naturally ask the question that, is there a program a invariant and ranking function combination such that the verification condition is satisfied in the symbolic heap semantics. That's what we call natural synthesis problem. And uh, this is a, a, uh, a sound reduction, so we showed that this, uh, this is a natural uh, sound reduction. In other words, if there's a solution to the natural synthesis problem, it's also a solution to the original synthesis problem. Okay, and uh, um, this symbolic heap is finite because we only care about numbers pointed by variables and you have finite number of manipulations. So it's of boundary size so that we have some hope to automate the reasoning. And the idea is to encode the symbolic heap using arrays and uninterpreted functions. So if we have a symbolic heap, we can represent it using a bunch of arrays. The location variable array maps every variable to uh, the ID of the symbolic node it, uh, it points to. And the symbolic is another array tells us um, the nodes are symbolic or not, right? So one means the node is symbolic, and zero means the node is concrete, and two means it's semi-symbolic. 
So one is semi symbolic because it points to a list segment. And uh, uh, directions, it's a, it's a point of field. Uh, two dimensional arrays, you are map every node and a field to uh, a different node. And we define uh, a lot of other arrays so that we can fully characterize the symbolic heap. And we can simulate the execution of statements uh, using arrays. So if we have an update to the v next field of v1, the heap got updated, we can represent the update on the heap, on the, on the arrays. So the next field of two got updated. And we can also simulate the function calls. Um, if there's a function call to v2, we just have a portion of the heap reachable from v2 and replace them with a fresh new symbolic node five and uh, uh, incorporate the, the post condition for, for the function call and we can update the, the arrays appropriately. So everything can be simulated at the, on the arrays and we encode this array representation and semantics into sketch and we also encoded a lot of synthesis enabling constraints, um, the, the, the constructs of our language into sketch so that we can uh, get uh, get the solution automatically synthesized. So uh, we, uh, that's, uh, that's a high level idea. We managed to tackle a lot of technical problems. Uh, for example, the array size uh, should be, uh, could be tricky. So if it's too large, it's not uh, solvable in practice. If it's too small, uh, it's not sufficient. Uh, for example, if you do some malloc, you will run to some cases that you have uh, out of memory problem. So uh, we come up with something called malloc budget. Basically, it's just an estimation. You start from a small number. As long as it's sufficient, then we uh, go with that budget. Otherwise, we increase the budget incrementally. Uh, we also uh, do a lot of strategies to reduce the search space. For example, we break the redundancy caused by symmetries. If you have two or three variables, um, v1, v2, v3, they can be assigned uh, um, symmetrically. So we assume that we always manipulate v1 first, then v2, v3. Uh, and the looping variance should contain a predicate if the predicates are closing the post condition. And the ranking function should be non-negative measure functions. So uh, some assumptions, templates help us to, to reduce the search space dramatically so that it becomes feasible. Uh, so we have successfully synthesized the manipulations for list, sort list, and the binary search trees. So the first part of the table uh, gives you some idea about how large, uh, so what the template looks like. Um, there are uh, unknown function calls, unknown conditions, unknown loops, and unknown statements. So by the way, all the uh, templates are available as uh, supplementary material for the paper. Uh, so you can take a look at what the template looks like. So a second part are about the performance statistics. So the first uh, column tells us the whole size. So in other words, it's a search space. Uh, for example, the 90 means uh, there are 90 unknown bits or two to 90 number of uh, candidate programs to search from. So this is a really large search space. Uh, the time spent by sketch to finish the synthesis. So as you can see, sometimes uh, the synthesis takes more than one hour, and sometimes we time out for sort of list merging. Uh, um, iterative implementations takes much longer time, but that's uh, uh, what we can we can imagine. It's uh, this is challenging. This has not been done uh, to our knowledge by any previous system. And uh, it's noteworthy that the synthesized solutions are always authentic. Uh, in other words, they are like the programs. Uh, uh, an average programmer would uh, manually write. Okay, so to conclude, we uh, propose a uh, natural synthesis, which is the uh, integration of proof theoretic synthesis with the natural proof methodology. Uh, we developed an efficient encoding to syntax guided synthesizer using uh, ar arithmetic arrays and uninterpreted functions. And for data structure manipulations, we have implemented ImpSync, which uh, can synthesize sort list and binary search tree implementations from bare bones skeletons. Uh, so that's all. Thanks. Thank you.